Okay. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, now we're going to be talking about uh, Chapter 16 in Michigan's uh, Money and Banking Text, and we're going to be looking at what's called the Taylor Rule. And so here's the interesting question we want to think about. Well, under ordinary normal circumstances, what's the right target for the federal funds rate? In other words, should it be relatively high or low based on what type of economic circumstances? And it turns out the Fed has what's called a dual mandate. By law, it's required to maintain price stability, and it does have some flexibility in terms of how it uh, defines that, and also full employment along with steady GDP growth. So those are kind of the, the second mandate there. And the difficulty, though, is that there could be some uh, tension between those two objectives. For example, suppose the Fed wants to uh, increase uh, employment and GDP growth. Well, it might pursue an expansionary policy, and that would tend to increase aggregate demand, that increase in aggregate demand would, of course, work to increase employment and GDP growth. But that same increase in aggregate demand might also work to increase inflation. And so there could, under certain circumstances, be trade-offs between achieving those individual objectives. And so what we want to think about here is, well, how might the Fed go about striking a balance between these two dual objectives? Well, let's consider four different situations that the Fed might find itself in. Suppose, first, that inflation is below target and that GDP growth is also relatively low. Well, in this situation, it, the, as we'll discover, the optimal strategy might be pretty clearly to reduce the federal funds rate. In other words, pursue an expansionary policy to increase aggregate demand, which would also work to increase inflation toward its target and GDP growth back toward its target. Likewise, suppose inflation is above its objective, and suppose GDP growth is also relatively high. Here, you will also get a relatively clear uh, policy signal. There, you might want to raise the federal funds rate. In other words, pursue a contractionary policy, which would tend to reduce aggregate demand. And lower aggregate demand would work to reduce inflation and to reduce GDP growth back toward its target. So these first two scenarios seem to be pretty reasonable. In other words, there doesn't seem to be a trade-off between achieving its inflation objective and achieving its employment slash GDP growth objective. But now consider the second two scenarios. Well, what if inflation is above the Fed's objective, but GDP growth at the same time, however, is relatively low? Well, now it's not quite so clear because, for example, as we'll discover, if the Fed decides to combat the inflation by pursuing, say, a contractionary policy, that would tend to reduce aggregate demand, and that, in fact, would work to reduce inflation but it also might at the same time work to reduce GDP growth. So there could be some tension there. Likewise, in this last scenario, if inflation is below target and GDP growth is relatively high, again, it's the same outcome. It's not clear what the Fed's um, actions should be relative to its dual mandate. So what we could do is we could run a simple experiment if we wanted to. So we gather data on inflation, we gather data on GDP growth, and we also gather data on the federal funds rate, and we watch how the federal funds rate tracks inflation and GDP growth over time. So what we could observe then is, well, what does the Fed do with respect to the federal funds rate when it is confronted with those various scenarios we talked about? And so what we want to ask is this. Can the Fed's behavior be modeled? Is there an equation that can somehow replicate or, in other words, mimic the Fed's action? So we want to see this. And so this is what brings us to what's called the Taylor Rule. And the Taylor Rule does exactly, or at least attempts to, do exactly this. It tries to replicate the Fed's decision-making behavior with respect to changes in the federal funds rate. So on the left side of the equation, we observe the target federal funds rate. And so this is the outcome of the Fed's decision-making process. So the inputs into this are are. are seem fairly numerous, but turns out there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, intuition here. So uh, little pi is the actual inflation rate. The real federal funds rate is the, uh, as we'll discover, is the uh, target for the real federal funds rate, and I'll give a specific numerical example here in just a second. The uh, pi with the star is the Fed's target interest, or excuse me, the Fed's target inflation rate, GDP is the actual growth rate that we observe of real GDP. And then GDP star is the Fed's 
targeted growth rate. All right, so what I'm going to do here is it seems like a fairly complicated equation, but I'm going to go through and do a numerical example here in just a second to illustrate how this works out. But first, what we need to do is look at those 2.5 figures there. Now, if you do high powered math, you discover that if you add 0.5 and 0.5, of course, they add up to one. Well, when that happens in math, you should think of proportions or weights. So in other words, the Fed weights proportionally, equally according to the Taylor rule, both its inflation target and its GDP target. And it turns out, and I'll show you a chart here in just a moment, that the federal funds rate predicted by the Taylor rule seems to do a reasonably good job of mimicking, mimicking or tracking the actual federal funds rate. And what this means is it seems like, at least at first pass, the Fed's decision making, as complex as it is, can be reproduced, to some extent at least, by a mathematical model. Now, the best way to see how this works is to calculate some actual numerical examples. And so what we need to start with are some assumptions. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to assume that the real federal funds rate is 2%. Now, that assumption is just that an assumption. However, it's not very far off of the historical average real federal funds rate. I'm rounding a little bit because that makes our math just a little bit more convenient. I'm going to assume that the inflation target, pi star, is 2%. And historically, that, at least for the last uh, several decades, seems to have been the Fed's implicit inflation target. And more recently, that has become its more explicit inflation target. And then finally, I'm going to assume that GDP star is 3%. And I get that from sort of the average uh, real growth rate of GDP post-World War II. And again, that's not the exact figure, but it's pretty close uh, for our purposes here. So those are going to be my underlying assumptions uh, throughout uh, my examples here. Well, let's first confront the Fed with a problem where we've got inflation that's above target and GDP growth that's above target. So... Under that scenario, what the Fed should intuitively pursue is a relatively contractionary policy. What it should try to do is reduce aggregate demand to reduce both inflation and GDP growth. So let's see if we can generate that outcome. And so what we do, we plug in the 5% actual inflation rate. We add it to the 2% real federal funds target. And then what we do is this. We take half of the difference between our actual inflation rate and our target inflation rate. And of course, 5% minus 2%, that's 3%. Half of that, that's 1.5%. Then what we do is we take half of the difference between the actual GDP growth rate, which again, remember, is above target, and the target GDP growth rate. So we take half of one percentage point. That's, of course, half a percentage point. We sum all those up. And that gives us a target federal funds rate of 9%. Again, with a situation of relatively high inflation and high growth, that suggests the federal funds rate should, in fact, be relatively high. And that's precisely what the Taylor rule generates for us. Well, now suppose, let's, let's go with this angle. What happens if both GDP growth and inflation are exactly on target? Well, that would imply that the federal funds rate, or excuse me, the inflation rate is 2% and the GDP growth rate is 3% based on my assumptions. Well, we plug in the actual inflation rate, add it to the real federal funds rate, and we take half the difference between actual and target inflation plus half the difference between actual and target real GDP. Now, of course, since they're right on target, the values in parentheses, of course, reduce to zero. And the rest of that equation drops out. And so that we end up with a target federal funds rate of 4%. So this can be thought of a, what might be called a neutral federal funds rate that the Fed should be pursuing when the economy is exactly at the objectives that the Fed is interested in achieving. And what we can do, interestingly, is we can look at the Fed's own sort of view of its longer run target of the federal funds rate. So this is out of a recent summary of economic projections. And what it gives us is the Fed's longer term view of once policy normalizes, in other words, once the Fed achieves its objectives, 
what the longer run version of the federal funds rate might uh, converge to. And notice that it is tending to converge right around the 4% figure that I was just able to replicate. So even with my basic equation, and even with some simplifying rounding assumptions, I was able to replicate the Fed's own view of what the sort of the standard normal equilibrium federal funds rate is going to be. Well, now what if we get a different situation? Let's put some tension between the two objectives. So we're gonna put some tension in by having an inflation rate that is substantially above target and a GDP growth rate that is substantially, however, below target. So pursuing exactly the same mathematical uh, formulation we did uh, just a second ago, plug in the actual inflation rate here and here. And then again, half the difference between the actual and the target inflation rate. And then half the difference between the actual GDP growth rate and the target rate. Now, in this scenario here, notice that we have 0% minus 3%. That's, of course, going to be, uh, and, and half of that, that's going to be negative 1.5%. So that's going to work to put downward pressure on the federal funds rate. And so you're, when you run everything through, notice it comes up to be 7%. So compared to the example before where we had both high inflation and high GDP growth, this says that the in the uh, federal funds rate, the target federal funds rate should be a little bit more restrained compared to that previous example. But still notice the idea here is that compared to our sort of neutral 4% example that we just came up with a minute ago, the federal funds rate would still be relatively high. And the point of that would be to combat the relatively excessive inflation that exists. And so what we could do here is take a chart out of the textbook and compare the actual federal funds rate charted in blue with the predicted value from the Taylor rule charted in red. And you can see that on average, they track each other. In other words, on average, they both move up and down together. So there is a pretty good correlation. But you can see that there are a number of periods where they diverge from each other for at least a relatively long period of time. Like for example, in the 1980s, and like for example, in the in the early 2000s. And the, the idea is, for example, in the early 2000s, the actual federal funds rate was running below the predicted target federal funds rate by the Taylor rule. So according to the Taylor rule, monetary policy was a little bit too loose. So wrapping up here, what we've shown is that the Taylor rule can at least as a first approximation do a pretty good job of mimicking the behavior of federal funds rate over the most recent time periods. But here's a crucial thing to keep in mind. This doesn't mean that the Federal, Reserve, the federal Open Market Committee sits down, plugs numbers into the Taylor rule, and then out pops the correct federal funds rate, and then they go home for the day. That's not how they actually do things. All we're trying to do here is to come up with an equation that seems to replicate or mimic the actual decision-making process that the Open Market Committee has. And then what we will want to do in class is to address the issue of, well, what happens when the federal funds rate hits the zero lower bound? To what extent is the Taylor rule applicable, and how should the Fed go about making decisions? Thank you very much.